right, good morning, everybody. If you're in the lobby, come on in. Uh, but we're starting the service this morning a little bit different. Uh, we actually have a video from one of our missionaries down in Mexico, I believe, right? Yep. So there's a video here, and then after that, Mary, her mom, will be out to talk about it. So here's the video. Good morning, MCC. Hi, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Grace Ofalit, and I'm a missionary in Mazatlan, Mexico, with an organization called Youth with a Mission. I just wanted to give you guys an update about what I'm up to currently and share ways that you can get involved. Uh, so I am currently staffing a discipleship training school, which is a six month school. And for the first three months, um, the students are in what we call lecture phase. And so they're getting to go to classes each week, getting to learn more about Father Heart of God, nature and character of God, spiritual warfare, evangelism, missions, all these things to equip and prepare them to go out and um, yet do missions. So for the next three months of the school is what we call the outreach phase. And so uh, the school will split up into three different teams. Um, and we'll take them and go and do missions, get to work with local churches, getting to go out and do street evangelism, hand out Bibles, things like that. So I will actually be helping to co-lead a team of 12 students and we'll be getting to go to Spain, which is so exciting. We're really excited to go and spread the gospel, getting to work with local churches, getting to go out and do evangelism, make the gospel heard, and um, yeah, just getting to go out and spread God's love in whatever way that looks like. Um, we're getting to go to Spain, which is a pretty closed country, a lot of atheists. Um, and a lot of Muslims and things like that. And so we're getting to go out and evangelize to these people and getting to show them God's love. And we're so excited to go and spread the gospel and um, yeah, work with local churches, do kids ministry, all these different things. Um, and so if you would like to partner with me or with my team in that, um, there's so many different ways. We would love for you guys to be praying for us, for unity in our team, for God to be speaking through us, um, for provision, all of these things. Um, and we would love for you to pray and consider donating um, either to me or to my team. I am still currently in need of $2,700 to be able to go on this outreach. Um, so if you want to donate, I do have a PayPal um, that I can give you. So if you want my contact information, um, my mom is going to come up after this video and then you can go and find her after the service and she uh, will give you my email or my Facebook. Um, and so, yeah, and if you're interested in hearing more about what I'm up to each month, I put out newsletters uh, so you can give my mom as well. You can give her my, your email um, and then I can send you those newsletters, let you know more about what I'm doing. Um, and if you're wanting to know more about uh, my Spain trip or the team or whatever, um, you can also feel free to message me and I would love to share more about that with you. Um, yes, but I would love for you to consider donating. Um, our due date was actually on Friday, but luckily um, they've extended it till Monday morning. Uh, so if you're wanting to donate, please feel free to do that um, as soon as you can. And there's also a way that you can donate through the church as well. So my mom will come up and explain that. I hope you all have a great morning. And yeah, I'll see you next time I come home. <laughs> okay, good morning. I'll see if I can do this without crying. I did that last time. Um, <laughs> So as of last night, um, she just found out that Spain is now closed. So they will not be going to Spain. Um, they will still be going out somewhere. They're not sure yet, probably South America. Um, but that doesn't change any of the other things in the video. She still um, is in need of support. Um, she's still um, in need of prayer. Um, so. Um, it, back at the um, welcome desk, I have in a little Mexico cup, there are um, slips that I made up with her um, email, her PayPal, and um, her Facebook. So if anybody is interested in um, being in contact with her, because yes, she's going um, on an outreach soon, but she's always um, down there any kind of letters or encouragement that anybody wants to send her or prayers um, is greatly appreciated. 
also, I said, if you know anybody that has a child as a missionary, please just pray for them. You know, every time a birthday comes and, and they're not here, um, it's, it's a little hard. So um, if you can just be praying for their families and siblings, and um, that's also something I think we don't think about. Um, and also, she does have ongoing needs, um, even when she's not doing a, a team or an outreach um, uh, DTS that they do um, like a soccer ministry. And so every week they're out in the community helping the kids. And so they, they need resources for that. So um, any way that you guys are willing to do, you know, any kind of support for her would be greatly appreciated. Um, and so, like I said, there's also um, the slips are back there, and there's also a way you can donate through the church. If you ask one of the people behind the desk, they have slips that you can do that through the church also. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Glad you're here.
cross this morning, Lord.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, the God of all the earth, who created the heavens and the earth, I thank you that you remind us that you don't need anything from us, but you want us. All that we're singing about today, Father, is relationship, that you desire to know us. You desire for us to come back to be your children. And that was done when Jesus took our sin on the cross and brought us the victory. Jesus rose again. He's seated at your right hand. And now we are yours. I thank you, Father, and I bless you. And I thank you that you gave us the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left, he said he was going to give us the Holy Spirit to live in us, that we would know you, we would become more like you, Father, and that we would love you. Father, I just pray right now that you will send your anointing, that you will anoint Pastor Jay as he speaks, that his words will be from you, that they will be anointed from the throne, and that anything that's of the flesh will fall away. And we just bless you and thank you, Father, because you are faithful. And we know that when we pray, you hear us. And we thank you for your goodness and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. All right, how about this side now? Good morning. All right, this side, beat them. Oh, well, good morning. Now the middle. Good morning. No, there was somebody over here that said good morning during the... Yeah, exactly. uh, who doesn't follow directions? Oh, yeah, okay. Hey, I want to, give you, wanted to make you aware of a couple different things. One is something we say every week, but really important. In your bulletin is what's called a keeping in touch form. And we just ask if each and every week, if, if at least one person from each family would, would fill that out for us, throw it in the, in the baskets in the back. We'd really appreciate it. It's, it's our way to keep connected with you. And anything, anything you want to know or any prayer requests or or anything like that would be put on the Keeping in Touch form. We could stay connected that way. Also, if giving is, is part of your worship, we have the, the bins in the back on your way out. You can give that way as well. There is something in, in two weeks that's coming up that we're really excited about. We've been excited about for a while. Uh, it's something we've been doing year after year after year, and it's just been gr a great event each time. And it's, it's the men's retreat that the men are getting together uh, for, for a Friday and a Saturday. It'll be June 11th and 12th, so, so two weeks from now to, to, to get into God's Word, to worship together, to, to have a good time, to laugh. It's just, it's just a great, great weekend. Uh, and, and did I mention some incredible food as well? And so that's really exciting. I mean, I mean, I know some of you guys like scrap, but we'll put that aside. But the rest of the food is going to be good. Um, Somewhere Jim is, is glaring at me right now. Uh, so we're excited. June, June 11th and 12th, I'd really encourage you to sign up. Some, some of the guys say, oh, well, I can't make it the whole weekend. Well, there's a lot of guys that come up just for Friday, or there's a lot of guys that come up for just for Saturday. I would encourage you that any part of that, it's only, only 45 minutes away, really, any part of that at Hemlock Springs that you can make it up to, it is going to be beneficial for you, not only with connecting with men, but I, I guarantee also in your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's going to be a really, really great weekend. So you can go online and sign up. You can, you can mark in your Keep in Touch form. We'll help you sign up. Whatever way you can do that, I would really encourage you to jump in on, on that as well. This weekend is, is Memorial Day weekend, and, and um, it's the, the weekend, and really should be more than a week, the weekend, but really, especially this weekend, we remember those who, who have sacrificed so much so that we can have the, the freedoms that, that we have. And we as Christians, we should be the best at this because our entire faith, our entire lives are based around the fact that somebody laid down their life for us and then rose again on the third day. And so we should, above all, everybody else, understand the importance of, of sacrifice. Everybody knows John 3.16, but there's another verse, 1 John 3.16, that I don't think is known very well, but, but is, is just is so important and I think really, uh, really describes beautifully what this weekend is really about. And, and, and John writes this in 1 John. He says, he says, and this is love. And anytime the Bible is going to say to you, 
he's going to give you a real definition of love because we don't know what love is. But when the Bible tells us this is what love is, we should pay attention. And he says, this is love. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. It's a perfect illustration of what we're remembering this weekend. Check it out. Good morning, everyone. Is this thing working now? All right. First service, I was having a little trouble with the, with the mic thing here. So uh, I was just making sure it was working. So uh, my name is Pastor Jason. For those of you that might not know me, I am uh, I pastor here, but also I pa- uh, campus pastor over at our Birdsboro campus. So this morning I'll be sharing with you. I thought it was really good this, uh, what Bill said this morning about um, Memorial Day weekend, what we're celebrating with uh, those who gave everything, you know, for us and our freedoms, and and really to really look at that, um, you know, uh, Jesus was a man that came to Earth and and did that same thing for us. So uh, I thought that was really good to really put those two together. Um, anytime us humans do something that that can uh, represent Jesus like that, that's that's a good thing in anybody's book. But we are in the series. Contrast going through 1 Samuel today. Uh, today we'll be in chapter 4 through 7. And um, once again, like, like a lot of times in the Old Testament, we see Israel totally making a mess out of things, and um, which isn't much different than today, though. But, uh, but <laughs> they actually messed up. They lost the ark in these chapters to the Philistines, their enemies. So this was a huge thing for them. And and most of us know who the Philistines are because of the constant battle between them and the Israelites ever since they got into the promised land. So in these chapters, we'll, we'll really see the contrast between the Israelites, God's people, and the Philistines, which we'll just call them the world. And, but we also see the Philistines have a fearful respect for our God, but the Israelites kind of take God for granted. And that's really shown... Um, in these chapters where they lost the ark because they just kind of brought the ark in as a good luck charm. And a lot of us might have good luck charms. Um, I don't know if any of you out there have them. 
I know um, I'm a hunter, so I have my lucky hunting socks and my lucky hunting shirt. I mean, I don't put a whole lot of faith in that, but it makes me feel a little better when I'm out there. But um, also, uh, we all know that, that anything that happens is ordained by God. But some of the more popular good luck charms are the four-leaf clover, the horseshoe, and uh, the rabbit's foot. And I thought it would be pretty cool to kind of find out the facts of those, see why they're so lucky. Um, so I went to uh, golfcoastnewstoday.com, and this is what they told me. They said that uh, the four-leaf clover supposedly goes back to Eve, where she carried it out of the Garden of Eden. Now, I never read that in the Bible anywhere, so I'm not sure where they got their information from, but that's what they said. And also, there's, there's 10,000 three-leaf clovers for every four leaf. So I guess it's just a little lucky if you find one of those out of 10,000. The horseshoe, um, that was believed to have magical powers to ward off spirits of your past um, by combining the iron and the fire. I'm not really sure how that works either. If you put metal in the fire, I'm not sure how that does anything spiritual for you, but that's what that's supposed to do. And the rabbit's foot, I didn't find a whole lot about the rabbit's foot, although it just came back from the Celtic time and it had to be the left hind foot of the rabbit. So you had a lot of rabbit's without the left hind foot probably going in circles out there. So that might have been a little interesting. They're probably easy to find, that's for sure. But um, a lot of times in in Major League Sports, you see uh, good luck charms or or like rituals they do. Uh, Wade Boggs is one. He's a baseball player. He had to have chicken before every game. Um, Michael Jordan, another one you guys might know. Uh, He actually wore his college shorts underneath his bulls. Um, outfit every game, which I thought that was kind of weird. And Serena Williams, a tennis pro, she actually never changes her socks if she's winning a tournament, so that's pretty nasty. I mean, I'm sure she's not fun to be around. But the fact about good luck charms is, yeah, they they seem pretty innocent, um, but really we're we're using them kind of as a shortcut uh, to a better future or protecting ourselves from bad mojo and and yeah, that seems innocent, but really when we look at Scripture, God really warns us of that. And, and Noah may not seem like as much as the Israelites did um, with their different uh, gods that they, they worshipped other than, than the one God. Um, it's a big deal to God. And, and we see in, there's a lot of script, but, but especially Micah 5.13 says, I will destroy your carved images and your sacred stones from among you. You will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. So these things might seem innocent, but really, um, if you're looking at them as a good luck charm, they really, it's a form of idolatry, and he warns us of this. And, and how many times do we read the Old Testament to ourselves and think, what are these Israelites doing? I mean, they are a complete mess. I'm, God does all these things for them, and then they, they keep falling back into sin. They keep falling into false gods. And I have a few examples here. So, all right, right when God brings them out of slavery in Egypt, he parts the Red Sea for them to leave, which is a pretty big deal. I mean, that's kind of a clear that God's with you. So they go through the Red Sea, closes up on their enemies, and yet they get to the other side, they get in the desert, and they're complaining about, you know, oh, I don't have any food now. I don't have any water. We should have stayed in Egypt. So, you know, at least we're getting fed there. And uh, so they've seen the miracle, but, but still weren't happy. And then you see uh, God takes them finally into the promised land. He takes them all the way through to the promised land and says, I'm giving this promised land, this, this beautiful land to you guys. Just go in and take it. So what do they do? They send out f- spies. And a lot of the spies came back and said, hey, these guys are too big and tough. We're not going to be able to take them. So I just say that we hang back a little bit. So they end up wandering around the desert for 40 years. Um, so God finally gives them victory over them. Joshua takes them into the promised land. Um, but then... Through the time, we see them constantly fall away from God and get enslaved again. And even though these Israelites mess up all the time, and even though they, we feel like these miracles that they would have seen are super huge, it's really familiar to what we deal with today because although I mean, we might not have seen the Red Sea part, we see some pretty cool stuff. I mean, if you're a believer, I mean, some of the miracles. That God, our God is a huge God today, just as he was back then. And... Um, we see some really cool, like, like I, me personally, I've seen marriages restored, marriages that you would have never guessed these people would come back together restored through God. I've seen finances, people that were struggling with finances, um, they got restored. And uh, you just see all these great things, but yet we still forget so easily, you know, what God has done. 
And I think it's easy because um, the, these things that we're worried about, they're, they're in the natural world. We, we see them. We can touch that stuff. And we don't really always think about the spiritual part of it. And I think it's important for us to, to realize that that spiritual battle is going on. And that's really the battle that we should be most concerned about. Because um, the biggest contrast for us believers is light and dark. And uh, you're either living in the light or you're lost in the dark. And so there, there are two things here in First Samuel that we'll be looking at in these chapters. And it will, first of all, be the contrast between good and evil, light and dark. And um, it will also be the glory given or not given to God through everything. So we're going to start off in First Samuel and, and uh, chapter 4. And, and once again, they think they're doing pretty good. You know, they're just hanging out. But um, then they decide to go fight against the Philistines. And the thing is, this chapter starts off, it might seem a little out of place that, that, that 4.1 actually says, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. Um, as you, Mike was talking about last week, though, Eli and his sons were kind of messing up. And, and, and back then, Eli was the head of Israel. He was the prophet, and, and he was the judge, and, and he kind of led Israel before they had kings. Now, um, this is the part where God is finally bringing up Samuel to take over for him. So this is pretty early in Samuel's, um, for him being a prophet. So it might seem weird to to start off with that, but then we see right after that that Israelites go into battle with the Philistines. But the funny part is we don't see, which a lot of times that we see through Israel's victories, we don't see Israel um, anything saying in, in, in in this chapter that, you know, uh, the Lord talked to Samuel and told them, you know, go, go fight the Philistines. We'll hand them over to you or um, anything like that. They're, they're, or Samuel inquired of the Lord and he told them, you know, yeah, go, go fight against the Philistines. We didn't hear any of that. So um, I think it's really important even for us today that whenever we make a big decision like that, I mean, for us, it, it might be uh, for a relationship maybe, uh, maybe moving for a job, changing jobs or uh, – may a financial decision, buying a car or buying a house or whatnot, that we really inquire the Lord. And yeah, we might not be going into battle, but it's always good to have that, um, first of all, letting them in that decision and moving forward with that. But um, for the Israelites, by not inquiring, inquiring of the Lord, they took it upon themselves to go into battle. And we see in verse 4-3, it says, when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat against us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hands of our enemies. So I think we have to um, kind of take into account right here with this verse. I know it's real easy to think, oh, the Israelites weren't thinking right or whatnot, but we, it, Israel was in a lot of turmoil right now. I mean, Eli and his, his, his sons were a mess um, they're clearly far from God at this point um, because they're, they're, they were saying, hey, we got to bring the ark, this object, like kind of like a magic genie, you know, bring it in for this next battle. And uh, they really lacked the leadership because Eli was just a mess right now. He knew um, that, that, that Samuel was coming up to take his place. And I'm sure that was probably on his mind pretty much. I mean, he already had, uh, his family was already cursed. He already knew that. So the Israelites were in a bad place. At this time, so I think we got to take that in, into account. And the Israelites, we can't be so hard on the Israelites for thinking bringing the ark there would help them because in the past that's what they knew. I mean, when they came into the promised land, God said, Priests walk into the river, into the Jordan with the ark. And then the water stopped and they could cross. So the ark was involved in that. And then when they got to Jericho, they said, God said, walk around the walls of Jericho with the ark. So they did put a lot of um, emphasis on the ark, which made sense, you know. I mean, you can't really wrong them too much for that. But they did lose focus of exactly, I mean, yes, the ark was a thing to carry around, but they lost the focus of what the ark was all about, you know, and their heart were not in a place that, you know, God is the one that has the power, not the ark. So they sent for the ark, and I mean, they think they have this thing figured out. I mean, they're partying like it's 1999, they're all jumping around, and uh, the Philistines are like, 
uh-oh, you know, what did they come up with? They must have a secret weapon or whatever. And then they, they know. I mean, the Philistines, it's funny because the Philistines are actually very aware of if God is with the Israelites, no one's beating them. But the Israelites weren't always there. You know, their heart wasn't always there. So it's, it's funny that they celebrated too early. And, and I thought it'd be kind of funny to see some of these videos um, of people celebrating too early just to kind of, I don't know, make fun of them and kind of see what the Israelites would have been like. But, uh, you know, you got those videos? Oh, yeah. Right. All right, so there's a lesson there. Do not celebrate until you actually win because you're going to look a little ridiculous. You'll probably end up on a video. So um, verse 10 and 11 says, So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So this is the beginning of the fruit of God's judgments against Eli's family. And uh, both of his sons were killed in battle, and Eli's death followed shortly after. But Eli's death was because they came back, and he heard about his sons, but not because his sons died. He heard that the ark was captured, and he fell over in his chair and broke his neck and died. So that's how Eli. And it even went all the way down to his grandson, they named Ichabod, saying the glory has departed from Israel. So that poor kid had to go through life with a name meaning the glory has departed from Israel. So that had to be pretty rough on him. Um, but because Eli's sons were living in the dark and they weren't living in a godly way, and Eli was not holding them accountable, his whole family suffered, and Israel also suffered with them. And I know it's easy to blame Eli's sons because of what they're doing in the temple, but really, Eli was the, the prophet and, and the judge in that time. He should have been kept keeping them accountable, you know. So really, the, the, the fault lies in Eli. And, and I thought that was really something important for um, anyone out here that leads anything, whether it's a ministry, whether you're leading your family, or if you're a boss at your work or whatnot, that the things that you do or the things that you don't do, doesn't only affect us as leader, but also affects those who we are leading. So I think that's a really important lesson to learn there. Um, so now we see in chapter 5, the Philistines have the ark, and they're super excited about it. They're like, hey, we, we, we got the ark. We beat the Is Israelites. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to bring this ark, and we're going to stick the ark in, in our God's temple, which was in Ashdod, and, um, and that was Dagon. Their, their God. So what they did is they took the ark in there, set it in there, and they're like, all right, well, now our God can kind of show their God who's boss. And it's funny because in the Old Testament, if anyone says that God doesn't have a sense of humor, go into this chapter because this is the poor Phil. I, you almost got to feel sorry for the Philistines, but this is, there's times in our life where we made bad decisions and we have to deal with those consequences. Now, um, yeah, my wife's not in here, but now, but my wife was one of the best decisions I made. And, um, and really, I did make decisions in my life, though. A lot of you that are here probably heard my testimony before, but um, I didn't get saved until I was 35. So I went through most of my life not knowing the Lord. And uh, I was married before that, quite a while before that, um, to Lynette, uh, probably, I don't know, it was a while, 10 years or so. And I had children, you know. So... The problem was I wasn't saved back then, so I wasn't really being the godly father and the godly husband I was supposed to be. And um, that was something I did, you know. Uh, that was choices that I made that were bad choices. And although, you know, Lynette, I mean, forgave me, the kids forgave me, they don't hold that against me. Uh, really, I hold that against myself sometimes, and uh, I have to deal with those consequences because of the decisions I made back then. Now, I do make better decisions now. I'm not perfect. I don't make great decisions all the time, but I do make better decisions now. Um, but because of, 
because of what I did and how I was back then, I have to deal with those consequences. And really, I, gotta, I, I hold that guilt in. Um, that really holds me back sometimes. But uh, I do have to feel a little bad for the Philistines because... They figured out pretty early it might have been, not have been the best thing to bring, bring this, uh, to capture the ark, first of all, and to bring it into their town. And what we see is um, they take it in, into their temple with their, their, their statue of Dagon. Now, this ain't a little tiny statue. It's, it's, it's a large statue. And uh, they come in the next day, and this, this giant statue is bowed down to the ark. It's flat on its face. So they're like, okay. Um, that was coincidence, probably. Someone probably just didn't build it well enough or whatever, so we'll just stick it back up, and uh, everything's going to be fine. Well, that would have been fine, except um, the next day they come in, and what do they find? The statue on its face, but this time, his head and his arms were broken off. It's just a torso laying there. So now you, now you can't really blame it on just coincidence, all right? And not only that, but during this time when they had the ark there, um, God inflicted uh, tumors on them uh, in that town and also all the area around it. So they have, they have this idea, all right, this, this might not have been the best idea, so we're going to move it to this other town. Uh, apparently our God can't handle this because, you know, he's messing with him and with us. So we're going to move it to another town. So what they do is uh, they, they move it to the city of Gath, and maybe it'll fare better, better there. And chapter 5, verse 9 says, but after they moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing in the great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. Now, okay, um, first city didn't fare well with the temple there. The second city, that didn't fare too well either, so we'll just send it to the third city. We'll try it there. And um, this city's like, nah, we don't want, you trying to kill us? Like you're bringing this thing here? You know, so they understood. So they decided it was going to be safer to give it back to the Israelites, which I think was probably a good decision. I mean, how many cities would you have to go through to inflict all this devastation on before you figured that out? But um, I thought it was pretty funny, though, how none of this says that the Israelites went after the ark. You know, none of this said, hey, we went in to get our ark back, you know. No, no. God's just in there destroying the Philistines by himself. You know, he's like, oh, they'll give me back sooner or later. I'll just keep doing his stuff. So I thought that was pretty funny that, that he's, he's taking care of himself, which he always can. Um, he don't need us, believe me. Uh, and I can't believe that, that the next verse doesn't say, and the Philistines seen all the wonders of the Israelites' God and decided to follow him instead of their made-up gods. But we don't see that. And um, I think I probably would have changed teams right about that. I mean, after all that stuff, but... They did not say that, and I think a lot of times uh, we don't really see that either. I mean, let's, let's take the country Israel, for, for example, this tiny country that everybody around can't stand, but yet they still are there. And why? there's no other reason they're in God's hands on that country. And, uh, and also other miracles that we've seen, um, like uh, illnesses cured and, you know, restoration of different things, and we still, um, we just mark that up as coincidence, so... So chapter 6, the Philistines are trying to finally figure out, okay, we got ourselves in a little bit of a pickle here. So we're going to have to get rid of this thing. And so they call in their priests and diviners and are trying to figure out how do we give this thing back now. We're in, we're in deep. How do we get this, this ark back to where it belongs without destroying ourselves more? And, but it's funny how the Philistines... They had their own God, but they're trying to figure out... I mean, they're scared of... They're scared of the ark, but also, the, you know, the Israelite God. Well, the Israelites weren't even that scared of their God. So it's kind of interesting to see that they're trying to figure out the right way to do this because they know the power of God. And they went out of their way to research it. And, and what happens is um, we see in 6.11, it says, They placed the ark of the Lord on a cart, and along with it, the chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumors, which were... Um, which were I can't think of the word right now, but they were giving it to, to our God. Um, so they, it's, it's really, really a thing to notice here is that they didn't open up the ark and put the stuff in there. It says they put a, a, cart neck, or a, a crate next to the ark and put this stuff in it. They didn't dare open the ark. So that's really important to remember. And um, so 
I also like the idea that they, they get two cows and they're going to put this thing on this, on this wagon. And they're like, all right, if, if this thing goes to Beth Shemesh where, where it's supposed to be to the Israelites, then we know. Like, they're just going to put this thing on a cart with two cows and be like, there you go. They're like, if this thing goes back to Beth Shemesh and it doesn't go off the trail, we'll know that it definitely was God doing all this stuff to us. But, you know, if it goes somewhere else, then we'll know it was just us. It was just coincidence. So it was, it was, they're still testing they're still testing the Lord with his ark. And, and it, that's, not, that's not crazy talk because we see it all the time in Scripture. We see Gideon, one of the judges, he's testing the Lord with, you know, oh, you want me to do this? Well, I'm going to put a fleece out there and put frost on one side and not the other if this is what you want me to do. And, uh, and how many times did I say, you know, oh, if I'm supposed to be here, let this light be green. Or if I'm supposed to go in this place, let there be an open parking spot. Or um, if I'm supposed to be... Uh, going on this hunting trip, let Lynette be super excited about it and not give me a hard time. So it's like, it's, it's like you always find these reasons to kind of test God. And the only thing that God says in the Bible about testimony is our finances. So if your testimony ain't more than that, I mean, it is what it is. But even we have trouble testing them on our finances, but we have no problem testing them on other things. Um, so the people of Beth, the, the, the cart does go to Beth Smash because the Lord was clearly involved in this. And... Um, so they get the ark back. They're celebrating. They're super excited. Uh, they didn't have to do nothing. The ark just came right back to them. And, uh, but the celebration was short-lived. And, and uh, verse 19 says that God struck down 70 of them for looking into the ark. Now, I said back when the Philistines were sending it back, they didn't open the ark to put that, the offerings in there. They had a different car for it. They, they, they knew better. I mean, apparently their people knew better than open up that ark and throw that stuff in there because if you're not qualified to look in the ark, don't look in the ark. So it gets it, the, the ark comes in and it, they open it up. I guess they open it up and the people were looking in there and 70 of the men were struck down. Now, this ark was r- roughly four feet by, by three foot, so it wasn't real big. Now, for 70 men to die for looking in this, in this ark, um, they couldn't have did it all at the same time. There's no way 70 guys could have looked in that ark at the same time. So I'm going to give you 20 guys that could look in there at the same time if they're gathered around it, all right? So they look in there, God strikes them dead. What are these other 50 guys doing to get struck dead? I mean, are, are they just like climbing up like, well, you know, Jim went up there and he didn't look in there, right? So I'm going to just look up and look kind of side-eyed at it to see if I can see what's in there. No, it doesn't work. You can't look in the ark if you're not qualified. So it took 70 people to finally realize, okay, we're not allowed to look in this ark. You know, there's just a pile of men around this ark. So I just, I feel like there's a really good lesson in there for us, guys. Like, <laughs> If someone screws up something real bad, let's not try to do it our way. Like, let's just like, okay, that's probably not going to work. Let's not do that. Uh, it's probably, especially for us men, I think that would probably be more, more uh, better than anything else. But um, so finally, after, after 70 of them were struck down, um, they didn't want anything to do with it either. Like, wow, we clearly don't know how to handle this thing. So they send it back to uh, Kiriath Jaren where it was actually held and um, those, they knew how to handle it. And it was actually held there until David moved it out into Jerusalem. So those guys knew what they were doing. Let's get the ark back where it actually belongs. So this was quite a mess that the Israelites were in. I mean, an absolute mess. And, um, and how could they mess up that bad? I mean, I'm sure we would never do anything like that today, right? Like we couldn't mess up that bad, but... Honestly, we mess up pretty bad all the time. I, I definitely mess up really bad all the time. And maybe, maybe it would be good for us to kind of, I'm going to give us a few things here that we might just want to, some pitfalls that we might want, just want to stay away from to help us out, you know, in our walk. So I'm going to give you guys a few of them. And, and the first one here is quit trying to go into battle alone without clear direction from the Lord. I think that's a really important lesson to learn from Israel here. Um, if you got a huge decision or something like, do not jump into it. Like, step back, inquire the Lord. I mean, I know a lot of people say, I, I don't hear from the Lord, and, and yet I understand that, believe me. But seek wise counsel then from someone, you know, that you do trust their word and kind of talk to them about it. Just don't jump into decisions. Um, because as we can learn from the Israelites, it doesn't always go well. And for them especially, unless they had clear direction from God, it didn't go well. 
So the second one is quit trying to put God in a box. God is much bigger than our church building. He's much bigger than our Jesus t-shirts. He's much bigger than our fish on the back of our car. He's much bigger than the cross on our neck. He's just much bigger. Those are all man-made things. And it's great. I mean, I think it's, it's an okay thing to have that stuff to really, uh, for me, it starts up different conversations with people, you know, about the gospel and stuff like that. But you can't put your faith in those things, you know. Our only faith should be in God. And, and yes, God may have dwelled in, the ark, dwelled in the ark when he wanted to, but without God being in the ark, guess what? The ark was just a really cool box, an expensive box is what it was. I mean, without God with it, it's nothing. It's man-made. So I think that's really important for us to get from this too. And when you trust in anything other than the grace of God, you'll find yourself disappointed in, in, at some time. I, I guarantee you that. And, and because no matter how your ministry is doing, doing, no matter how often you're in the church building, no matter how much you talk about God things, um, unless he's involved in it, it's, it's really not going to mean anything. So here's the third and last one. Be aware of the constant war going on around you at all times. Never let your guard down to the spiritual battles that happen every day because the enemy is always looking to capitalize on that. And remember who God is, not who he was, not what he did in the Old Testament. He's a living, powerful, graceful, and loving God. And always remember, too, though, that Satan is real also, and we do have an enemy, guys. And I thought it was really cool my... um, I think it's really weird that I'm, I'm quoting a meme from Facebook up here, but I'm going to do it because I thought it really got me thinking. Uh, my sister-in-law posted a meme that really made me think uh, this past week, and it said, if the devil can talk angels out of heaven, he can talk you into hell. So be careful who you listen to. How true is that? I mean, Satan was originally in heaven and brought a third of the angels out of heaven, got kicked out of heaven with him. So he's really good at what he does. You know, he's really good at what he does. And and if he could pull those angels out of heaven who were in the presence of God in heaven, how easy it is for him to just kind of, you know, change our look on things, just twist things a little bit to get us thinking a different way. So just be really aware of the spiritual battle going on around us. And always remember with us being Christians, if you're a Christian, that there has to be some sort of contrast between us and the world. I mean, there just has to be. If you have the Lord, there would definitely be a contrast. And in 1 Samuel, you had the Israelites, God's people, which were adopted into the family as Christians, and then you had the Philistines, who we'll call the world, the unbelievers. So it's really the same. We got the Christians and the unbelievers today. Just It's just not the Israelites and the Philistines. It's the Christians and the world. But contrast, the, the definition of contrast is something that is different from another thing, a difference between people or things that are being compared. So I think that's perfect for this series because um, if there isn't any contrast between us and the world, then we, we really got to step back and, and reevaluate some things. Um, so, because especially now, because we don't have to carry a box around or worry about an ark. We carry, if you're saved, you have, you know, you have the Holy Spirit in us. So we have more power you know, we have as much power as, as Jesus says, we have as much power as him or more because we had the helper with us. So, um, so what I want to uh, challenge you guys with um, is really just pay attention to what we need to do better, uh, be better prepared for the battles that we're going to come up against, knowing that we have God in us, which means we're never out of his presence. And I ch- challenge everyone in here, uh, to inquire of the Lord if you got any big decisions you're going to make. Um, talk to him first. Talk to wise counsel. Uh, anybody that, that, you know, you just really trust to give you godly wisdom. Um, there's so many times in Scripture when, when people have messed up because they rushed into things, and just don't let that be you guys. Uh, there's, there's no good luck charms. Um, that is better than having a living God in your corner. I guarantee you that. And uh, even though you're not carrying around a statue of God or a golden calf or a wooden totem pole, we can still easily make things, uh, idolize different things. So now I've been mainly talking about Christians um, here, so the ones that accepted Jesus. Now, if you're in here or you're watching online and you don't know who Jesus is, um, I like to really say because 
I think for me, before I was a believer, it was really easy for me to kind of thought I knew what church was all about and thought I knew what, who Jesus was. And I, yeah, I heard of Jesus, you know, he's part of the church. Or I know God, they talk about him in church. But no one ever really explained to me exactly, you know, why is Jesus so important? You know, why is God so important? So um, if you don't know Jesus and, and no one ever explained really why he's so important, talk to someone about that. Um, talk to, I'm sure everybody knows someone that they know uh, is a believer. Or if you don't, um, you can come here on a Sunday morning and talk to the prayer team and talk to anybody on staff. Uh, a lot of people here would talk to you about it and really kind of let you know who that is. Now, if you are a believer and those people come up to you and talk to you, man, make sure, you know, uh, you just really let them know your story because the testimony is so powerful. So just really let, let them know what you found out about it. And, um, and even if you can't help and if you feel nervous about it, because I know a lot of us don't think we know enough and we can't tell people about Jesus. Hey, just say, I, I, don't really feel, I don't feel like I could do it any justice. Let me take you to this person or whatever. That's perfectly fine. So, um, yeah, so I think it's really good for us to constantly be, I mean, of course it's good for us to be constantly sharing Jesus, but I think it's constantly, I think it's good for us to explain who Jesus is. And it's great to give the gospel, um, and that really does explain it, so if, if, if you're going that route, that's awesome. But um, with that being said, I'm going to pray for you all for the rest of this weekend. Uh, so Father, we just thank you for everyone here. We thank you for um, our salvation, if we have that, Lord. I pray that anybody that doesn't know you, I pray they find that person or you put that person in their path that can share you with them, uh, that they can really explain who you are and the importance of you and, and how you loved us and your grace and your mercy, Lord. And, and just let them, man, I feel like everybody should know. If we're a Christian, I mean, it's so nice to know that you are with us all the time. So I, I just want everybody to know that, Lord. I pray for um, wisdom for those here that do know you that um, may have different chances to share you with different people or that someone might come up to them and ask them about you, Lord. I pray that you just speak to them. I pray that you take away all nervousness that they don't know enough, Lord, and I just pray that you speak for them. Let them come to you um, and ask for your wisdom and, and uh, to, to speak through you for that, Lord. I, I, I pray for all the families out there this weekend that lost loved ones in the service, Lord, that we are celebrating this weekend. I pray for those... Um, Man, that, that, that you just give them peace over this time, that you just give them, uh, put people around them to just really build them up, Lord. We just thank you for this weekend. Uh, I just pray for everybody to um, just really encounter you this weekend and to really take anything that was set up here today, uh, that you just make it, um, you just give it to them in the way they need to hear it and just write your scripture on their heart, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the
Blessing on everyone as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week, everyone.